All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us uh, started. Um, a couple quick announcements, and then we'll, we'll get into things. Um, first off, I know that a few of you last week had uh, some questions about how Blackboard was uh, indicating some of the, uh, uh, the, the quiz grades, like some stuff was showing up twice. I called uh, Blackboard th themselves, and they basically dug into the class, and, and they didn't say anything wrong on, on our end. So if, they're, if your Blackboard account is showing some, some duplicate grades, you might want to contact them yourselves and see if it's an issue with your account. The reason why I say that, if it's happening to this class, it might be happening to other classes as well. But again, rest assured, I've got all of your grades. If you're getting the quizzes done, I've got them. So, uh, so, so there's, there's no issue on the grade side. Um, I did want to mention a couple things about the, the next couple of weeks, because um, I've started to get some questions about this. The next few weeks in here are going to be some sort of Marshall-themed presentations. And uh, specifically, week 11, I think, is going to be pretty important, because week 11, we're going to discuss uh, how to register for classes for next semester. Uh, and go through some things like what you need to take next semester, uh, some general pieces of advice and whatnot. And I think a lot of those questions are going to be answered uh, in that session. So I just wanted to uh, bring that up. Uh, any other uh, housekeeping questions before we get things kicked off? OK, so uh, we're going to continue the same uh, uh, pattern that we have in previous weeks. I'm going to start off by having one of our faculty members introduce themselves for a few minutes, and then I'll turn it over to our uh, main speaker. So for this week, I have one of our mechanical engineering faculty here. His name is Dr. Iyad Hijazi. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself and uh, what he does here at Marshall. So let's everybody, let's give it up for Dr. Hijazi. Here's this. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Dr. Yad Hijazi. Maybe some of you have taken my I taught uh, a computer design class for mechanical engineers and for civil engineers. Also, I teach the material uh, course currently, so maybe some of you uh, have taken a class with me or taken a class right now with me. Uh, I joined uh, Marshall uh, University in the uh, year 2013, the fall 2013. Uh, background of my education, I did my, both my BS and Master's uh, at Kansas State University, and then I went back and I worked for 13 years in industry, and then decided to come back in 2010 and get uh, my PhD at New Mexico State University. So as you can see, my GPA has improved dramatically through, through the years, <laughs> studied harder, and maybe got more mature. Uh, okay, so uh, at Kansas State University, both when I was uh, doing my master's and my uh, PhD, I worked both as a teaching assistant and a research assistant. Most people are getting funded, you know, when you do your master's or PhD. Uh, so at Kansas State University, uh, I w actually my area was in computer area design. So uh, that's why I have a really strong background. In, I do C++ and a lot of uh, 3D packages during that time. And I used object-oriented programming C++ for my thesis. Uh, so my thesis was uh, development of object-oriented uh, feature-based design methodology for 3D solids. And then I implemented actually what we did in a software, 3D software. Uh, so that really helped me later on uh, when I got a job with one of the companies. Uh, then, uh, of course, I did uh, my master's uh, at, uh, I worked both as a teaching assistant and uh, as uh, uh, you know, a research assistant at other universities, but uh, for Kansas State, in addition to, you know, doing my master thesis, I also did some graduate teaching assisting, like grading papers and, and so on for thermodynamics at that time. Uh, then uh, later on, uh, uh, I did, uh, after working for 13 years in industry, when I came back to, uh, to do my PhD at New Mexico State University, in the beginning, I did uh, my, uh, some research using finite elements, uh, uh, analysis on pyrotechnic valves. The, the, the research was funded by NASA. And then uh, once I finished this uh, project, I decided to switch to nanomaterials. So my background in programming uh, helped me to, to get into nanomaterials. I'm really enjoying it and still enjoying it until now. So I worked both as a graduate teaching assistant and a research teaching assistant during that time. Uh, published a couple of papers. Uh, and I'm still, actually, in some of my research, I'm still building on the things that I did uh, during my uh, PhD. And then uh, once I finished, I, went, I did my, also my postdoc at Georgia Tech, uh, continuing on this area. 
Uh, once I finished, when I finished my uh, master's and BS after my doing my master's, I, then I went back to Jordan. I worked in the uh, Jordan Pike Manufacturing Company. Uh, ordering material, I was the head of the import section. I was actually the only person in the, the department, so I was the head, ordering, <laughs> ordering materials uh, for the, uh, you know, for the steel, uh, the pipes and equipment, and so I ended up also taking 30 credit hours of uh, uh, courses of, uh, of, you know, course related to banking and uh, letters of credits and so on. Then, uh, you know, so it's the first job was, wasn't really exactly what I wanted. Then I got a job as a fire protection engineer. So that was an improvement. And I did that for a year and a half, designing sprinkler systems, both following the American standard, the NFPA, and the European LPC. Uh, and then once we used uh, Matt, uh, AutoCAD at that time and some software for uh, simulations of fluid dynamics and you know, make sure everything is good. And then, once we finish everything, also I work in the side. So almost, in a way, I work like a civil engineer, making sure that those sprinkler systems are installed correctly, everything is done right. And all the way up to testing and uh, commissioning of the, 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 uh, the system. Then after that, we got a better, better job, closer to what I like, designing uh, doing as a designer, working as a design engineer, and basically mainly working designing uh, plastic molds. So I was part of a team. One one portion of us would uh, do the design using actually used AutoCAD, and then we had a manufacturing team, uh, you know, making sure that we they manufactured the part using CNC. So it was really also really interesting to be uh, to to do this job. So I got good experience in designing plastic molds. Then I got a better job in Athens, Greece. The pay was maybe five, six times what I was getting in Jordan. And Greece, Athens, really is beautiful. It's a beautiful country. Lots of islands, lots of places to see. So I worked as a senior automation engineer. Again, my background in programming and design came handy, supporting engineering application uh, like uh, MicroStation, AutoCAD, Triforma, other things, but then I convinced them that I can help to develop a software, actually, a 4D navigator, uh, to build it uh, for to view. I mean, our clients were like Exxon Mobil, Shioda, Chevron. We're getting a lot of drawings, whether it's mechanical or civil or electrical, and they wanted a way, um, uh, something to be able to navigate through the projects and also to see things in 4D, linked to like Primavera to X, uh, SQL servers, where you can do color que queries and look at things. So I, I did this for me for seven years. We developed a, a 4D navigator, and now they're still using it, uh, both as commercially, they're selling it, and also in their projects. So that really uh, was really int an interesting time and exciting time for me. But then we missed the US, me and my family. We came back. I did my PhD, and my wife did all the PhD also at uh, both of us at New Mexico State University. And of course, I did my George Abbott, uh, not to mention once I finished, I, as I said, my academic experience really started with doing my postdoc at Georgia Tech, building on what I learned uh, during my uh, PhD. So we were doing simulations on absorption and diffusion. Uh, the project was funded by ExxonMobil uh, on zeolites. And basically with methane related to zeolites is used as a way to filter gases from uh, the, you know, the a product of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the gas, the natural gases that you get uh, from uh, refiners or other sources. Uh, so then uh, that's basically uh, after I get my PhD at New Mexico and did my postdoc at Georgia Tech, uh, I got a job as a associate uh, as an uh, assistant uh, professor at uh, Prince Mohammed uh, University in Saudi Arabia for a year and a half. And I taught a lot of the courses that I'm teaching right like, like now, like materials, corrosion, manufacturing processes, and, uh, and computational methods. Then I uh, applied for uh, uh, Marshall University, and I joined Marshall University in 2013. And since then, I've taught about like 10 classes. Uh, one of them is CAD for both civil and mechanical, uh, computational methods, um, engineering materials, manufacturing methods, uh, corrosion, nanomaterial, 
And of course, as a professor, I have to do a lot of other things, uh, advising, research, write proposals, uh, accreditation. I have a lot with the uh, our accreditation, the ABIT accreditation, and so on. And my research, again, still in uh, nanomaterial. Nanomaterial is an interesting area because the properties, uh, this, you know, as materials, there's a lot of combinations of uh, things that you can do with material and, uh, and, and try to find material with interesting properties. Could be mechanical, could be thermal, could be electrical, could be uh, magnetic properties, and so on. So things are on the nano level different than things on the bulk level. And of course, in nano materials, we build things from the bottom up. You know, uh, so uh, again, uh, it's an interesting area. It has a lot of applications, whether in space and uh, in electronics and medicine. And you see people work in nano material in whether in physics, or chemistry, or engineering. And this is, for example, one thing. Um, you know, this is core shell nano material, where if you start with uh, 30 atoms of gold. They would have certain properties in terms of electronics or magnetics. Swapping them, changing few atoms with maybe copper, suddenly you, you have what they call magic properties, and where now you have uh, different magnetic and electronic properties that are really have applications in circuits and other applications. Uh, currently, I'm working basically intensively with the hydride system. Uh, whether for uh, storage, palladium hydride systems, basically, for storage of hydrogen or for filtration. Again, so this is, uh, for example, palladium silver hydride. And uh, of course, we have the, the hydrogen here are the red atoms, and the, the, the blue are the palladium, and uh, AG is the green. And here, this picture shows that hydrogen like occupy, occupy either tetrahedral or octahedral position. And if run them, you know, the atoms will switch, for example, the simulation from the uh, high energy uh, tetrahedral to the octahedral. Okay, so this has a lot of application, in, as I said, in storage, in, uh, in filtration, okay? Uh, so this is something uh, that I'm working on, in addition uh, to other areas of nanomaterial. These are some of my publications recently. So uh, this year, I, we published one paper uh, in the molecular simulation, we did a presentation uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the energy <laughs> ASME 2018 International Conference on Energy Sustainability, and actually my graduate student went there and he presented the paper. Uh, and now again we're almost done with pr also publishing another paper. So we always I have like four graduate students doing. Uh, a project and three doing master's thesis, and already graduated two, uh, two students with master's thesis. And finally, I was, uh, we, as part of uh, being a professor, we have to write proposals. So lately, late, uh, lately we, we submitted a proposal, a joint proposal, uh, with two other professors from chemistry, one from geology, one from physics, for a new SEM machine, scanning electron microscope. I use it in my materials course, and uh, hopefully I can also use it in my research. And it's worth $400,000, and we're getting this new SEM uh, towards the end of this semester. And uh, I got some awards in the 2010. You know, this was nice. Actually, also even my paper, the last paper, when we went to the ASCME, it was nominated as one of the best papers. But and I didn't get the award this time. Uh, it depended on how maybe my graduate student did not do a good job in presentation, so we didn't get it. So that's basically part of what we do as a professor. Uh, we have to uh, teach courses, uh, prepare for classes, research, write proposals, advising, and so on. So really, it's a very consuming but interesting uh, job. So uh, anyways, one, this is something that we always cover in the engineering profession 104, that actually, as you can see, you know, I did my BS, then master's, then PhD. And of course, my income uh, would go up uh, as you get more educated. So this is, shows you that uh, the higher, the more education you get, uh, the more pay, and the less chances of being unemployed. And so it shows you uh, that uh, the people with uh, uh, less than high school, this is, of course, 2014. Uh, they make maybe uh, uh, less money per hour than what you would make if you are, have a high school diploma, 
versus if you have a college, uh, some college degree versus BS versus masters versus a degree in uh, doctoral, of course, you'll be making more money as a PhD holder than with you make usually if you have just a high school or a, a BS. So education uh, does pay, you know. And uh, so this is basically a summary of uh, my path so far from the time I started my BS all the way to being here at Marshall. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yes. I enjoy working with computers. So, so to be honest, <laughs> uh, if you put your mind into anything, you start enjoying it. So I also enjoy developing. Software development was also exciting. So that's what our sprinkler system was also. Really, once, once you, you put your mind into something, although I did not like being in the field, to be honest. <laughs> I like more being in the office, thinking that to be in the outside, uh, you know. So uh, nano, nano materials, I would say, right now, what I'm doing is very exciting for me. You know. And design is excellent also. Design, really, these days, especially with 3D printing, it opens the door for a lot of possibilities. You know, so anything else? All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you get that microphone off of it? Oh, yes. I'm going to keep my uh, introduction of our main speaker somewhat brief because she's got a really important topic to talk about today and I want to give her as much time as possible. You know, everybody in here, I, I know that your, your immediate goal right now is to get your, your bachelor's degree in engineering, but really what uh, sh you should be focusing on further down the road, everybody in this room should be thinking about getting their engineering license. Um, uh, I have uh, with us today Leslie Rozier Tabor. She's the executive director of the state licensing board here in West Virginia. And she's going to be talking to you about that licensure process. So everybody uh, uh, should be paying real close attention to what she has to say. And I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. So let's give Leslie a round of applause. Yeah. I'll get you loaded up. Okay. All right. So uh, real quick background on me while Greg is getting my slides up. I am a, a civil engineering graduate myself of West Virginia Tech. Went on to get my master's degree at WVU, started on my PhD, but then got an opportunity to go back and get my um, take my uh, teaching job in the civil engineering department um, back at my alma mater, and I did that for eight years before I took this position in 2002. So I've had this job for eight, almost 17 years at this point, and um, Greg is right. I know your immediate goal, and it's going to be the first step in the licensure process, as you'll see as I show you a, a quick slide here in a moment of every step along the way, is getting your ABET accredited engineering degree, so you're right on track here at Marshall. And then there's some other steps as you move into your senior year, and then what you should be looking for as far as a mentor and someone to work under when you graduate, and then four years out taking the PE exam. I will tell you, if you like what you're hearing here, it's going to get a lot more interesting uh, tonight at the Huntington Engineers Club meeting um, right down the road. Uh, we, I'm giving this presentation over two hours versus 30 minutes. A lot more detail, a lot more interesting uh, stories, and uh, a little bit more fun. I have never given this presentation in, in under an hour, so I'm going to talk super fast. I understand I'm being recorded. so. I don't know where that ends up, but it could get interesting. Um, but I just want to go over who I am as far as the agency I represent, the national organization that you're going to need to be familiar with when it comes to professional engineering licensure, what our duties are and what the national organization duties are, talk about um, why you need to be licensed to begin with, the examinations that you have to take. I know that's probably like a dirty word. You don't want to hear that, but there are two lengthy exams. Um, but I will tell you with any learned profession, whether you're talking about medical, being a doctor, a dentist, an architect, an accountant, um, frankly, even a cosmetologist, you're, you're going to have to um, take examinations beyond your undergraduate engineering education in order to enjoy the benefits, one of which uh, the former professor that was just up here mentioned was increase in salary. In order to enjoy those benefits, you're going to have to um, 
to move on and take that initiative on your own. And it is an initiative you'll take on your own unless your, unless your boss gives you a kick in the butt because no one's going to force you to do it. But it's also going to, you're going to plateau and not be able to move forward unless you do it. Okay, for everyone that's here now, if you did not receive the packet, white envelope of information, when you walked in, um, we're, it looks like we're several short. So at my meeting tonight, I'm giving away uh, similar documents, but my coworker is coming to join me. He's going to bring extra. I just texted him. We'll get them to a student or a faculty member that attends our meeting tonight, and they'll be outside Dr. Michelson's door um, tomorrow. So make sure and get that. Everyone should at least have the engineering law booklet because there's plenty of those. So those are the two things that came with your packet, and I'll be referring to some of that as we move forward. Just real quick. Our website is plastered on multiple documents inside of that package. You'll need to visit there. I don't know what kind of assignment Greg might be giving you from class today, but perhaps you'll need to visit there to, to um, complete that assignment. But there's a lot of information about our agency mission, uh, vision, and history. But primarily, these are the two agencies, when it comes to engineering licensure, that you need to be familiar with. If you decide when you graduate you're moving out of state, just replace number one with the state that in which you are moving to because every state legislature has set up a board of engineering just like the bar for attorneys or the medical board for doctors that is in, uh, responsible for protecting health, safety, and welfare of the public via that agency. And ours is in, located in Charleston and the other is NCES. Um, and to save time, I won't tell you what it stands for. It's right here in front of you. But they are the makers and owners of those exams that I spoke to you about. And they have a lot of other responsibilities as well. So let me tell you real quick about ours. We're responsible for evaluating applications for both exams, um, for your references, your education, your experience, checking all those boxes before you're allowed to sit for the test. So ensure if you pass those tests, then you can be certified as an engineering intern, and then after a number of years of experience, you can become a PE. Then we will grant um, registrations to qualifying individuals who become PEs, companies to, become, um, to have a certificate of authorization so they can offer engineering services in our state. Um, we maintain those ra records for infinity. I mean, we have them, even after you pass away, we're responsibility, uh, responsible for maintaining the records on licensed engineers for life um, and beyond. Process uh, annual re license renewals. Actually, now it's biannual renewals. Just like with your driver's license, when you are issued an occupational license, professional license, you'll have to renew it every year, two, or three, depending on what state you live in. We're right there in the middle at a two-year renewal. And in order to renew, you have to turn in continuing education. So FYI, your education doesn't end upon graduation from Marshall University you'll be required to have continu continuing professional competency. And that doesn't mean you have to take college courses. You can attend seminars, conferences, obtain that in a variety of different ways, depending on what state you're in. And the number of hours you need um, is typically 15 a year. So it's like two days over a year. And, and Greg and I can tell you, we go to so many conferences, seminars, meetings, that you typically can double or triple that with no problem. With the good, all that's good, it's increasing your salary, it's taking on more responsibility, but with the good comes kind of the bad. And the bad, some of you I saw were flipping through the newsletter. If you can't sleep tonight, pop on our website or look at some of the newsletters for mo some of the most recent bad. And the bad is when you have complaints that are filed um, with our agency, we're, again, responsible for um, investigating those, determining if there is um, any type of wrongdoing with respect to their professional engineering duties and responsibilities, and in, if so, enforcing those. And so it can go as minimal as a reprimand, $250 fine, all the way up to right now we're sitting on someone waiting to pay us over $40,000. We have license revocations and suspensions, and in fact, if they continue to disregard the board's order, they can be put in jail. So that's just something you need to be familiar with. So we have five board members that are appointed by the governor and five staff members. Um, here are the gentlemen. I will tell you we've got a faculty member from West Virginia Tech. 
we've got a former department chairman from West Virginia Tech who's now consultant, 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 consultant. So again, they're from around the state and they have a number of criteria that have to be met. So many years in um, the profession, they have to live in the state, they must be citizens, etc. Here's the staff in our office, um, each one having different roles and responsibilities, but um, our, the, the lady in the back with the, uh, that's the tallest in the picture, she has recently retired and he's and been replaced by um, Edward Iglowski as our new board council. We're responsibility for, uh, responsible for having open meetings that are open to the public except for executive session, and that would be when something of confidential nature is being decided upon, like employment termination or uh, discussing ongoing cases that guilt or innocence has not been found yet. And so we abide by not only the engineering law that you have in front of you, but other parts of West Virginia law and open meeting proceedings, so we're, we have to advertise those meetings so far in advance, we have to make them open to the public, um, we have ethics commission rules we have to follow, we have filings with the Secretary of State's office, and then of course our agency. All this, th these screenshots are coming straight from our website, so as you can tell, we usually have an eight hour full day meeting, we meet every other month, this is the number of complaints and investigations that are going on at any given time, so um, you can view those agendas on our website um, in a, on that link, agendas and the minutes. Um, and now as far as the national organization, they're a nonprofit that's responsible for licensure of engineers and surveyors or, or rather the tools that helps the states to license them and that is primarily the FE and the PE exam. Um, they also encourage uniformity of standards throughout the United States for licensure. So if you get licensed here in West Virginia, should be pretty sure you're going to be able to get licensed in Texas or California. Now, because I'm at Marshall, I can say that. If it, I was at an engineering technology school like Fairmont, Bluefield, um, West Virginia Tech uh, has some technology programs, I'd have to be careful because we're only about among 60% of the states in the country that allow engineering technology graduates to move through the licensure process. So someone that gets licensed here with an engineering technology ABET accredited degree and wants to go get licensed in Kentucky, it's not going to happen because Kentucky doesn't recognize an engineering technology degree. So those are kind of things you need to be familiar with, but again, I'm telling you, you're on your path to a four-year ABET engineering degree here. So passage of the FE and PE and appropriate engineering experience, you'll you'll have no problem getting licensed in any state you choose to work. So uh, primary responsibilities of NCES, again I've said maker and owner of the exams, that's going to be the part that's most important to you. Um, they also do a lot of promotion and educational outreach. If you were a foreign degree holder, you have to have your, uh, an evaluation of that degree there. But primarily the application procedures, the rules, the law that governs our agency, to protect health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of West Virginia, you'll find in that book. That's one small um, section of the West Virginia Code. And again, no matter what state you move to, they might not have a pretty fancy little booklet like we do, but they have, there is a section of their law responsible for governing the professional practice of engineering. A lot of boards also are doubled up with surveyors, so some boards will be the Board of Registration for, for Professional Engineers and Land Surveyors in West Virginia were two separate entities. All right, so here's that step-by-step -step process. So you're well on your way to number one. In your senior year of this program or any time later, taking and passing the Fundamentals of Engineering exam. It used to be an eight-hour paper and pencil exam when Greg and I was ta had taken that exam. However, it's now computer-based test. It's five hours, you go into a secure site. There's one in Charleston, there's one in Morgantown in West Virginia, but if you want to take it in Hawaii on your spring break, it's a national exam. It's going to be recognized by any state because it's not our exam. That data is being filtered from NCES to these exam sites all over the world. And um, once you pass it, it'll be recognized by any jurisdiction. After you pass that test, you get four years of engineering experience, preferably under a PE. Doesn't always happen to be under a PE because you might go into an exempt industry working on private property for a private company that doesn't submit any type of um, drawings, et cetera, outside of that company. And so <clears throat> there is a slight possibility 
you could not have worked under a PE but still have qualifying experience? That's an important question. You know, a lot of times when you're going into a job interview even for the summer or um, four years from now, they might say, do you have any questions for us? And you usually just sit there, no, no. That's not good. You always need a question or two. And my recommended question is, do you promote a professional licensure? Are you going to um, help me to take study uh, sessions four years from now? Do I have a PE I'm going to be working under? Is there the possibility that um, you will pay for my application fees, support my annual renewal fees, et cetera? So those are really good questions, and they're going to be like, oh, this person's on top of it. They're thinking about four years from now, and, and they're seeing that they want to advance their career and accept additional responsibility. Good questions. When those four plus years take place after you've graduated, they can't, the time cannot start counting until after the graduation date on your transcript, and you gain that qualifying experience, you can sit for the principles of practice exam. That's the PE exam. That is still an eight-hour paper and pencil exam, but I will tell you just about the time this class is graduating, it's scheduled to transition to computer-based testing. Chemicals already there, nuclear is already there, next, next year environmental, next year mechanical. Moving on down the line, the greatest number of licensees that are registered are civils. It also is the um, discipline that's the most splintered, and there's, you know, you've got transportation, geotech, environmental, uh, structure. So it's the one that has the most resources that have to get into digital format because it is an open book exam. And so that's what takes so long for them to transition that exam. So it's scheduled to be transitioned about 2022, 2023. So you may be among the first class taking that via CBT as well. So it may not be eight hour. When we went from electronic to C or paper to CBT for, and that means computer-based testing, for FE is when we went from the eight-hour test to the five-and-a-half-hour test. So there is the possibility that will take place as well. So basically, what is licensure? What am I here for? What am I talking about? It's the recognized authorization to practice a profession. They set a minimum standard, minimum competency standard that has to be met through experience, education, and two examinations. Once meeting that standard, they say you're minimally competent to put those initials PE behind your name. It's assurance of, of, of an expert area in a particular field, and um, I don't know why that's doubled on the bottom. I guess it's doubly important. Um, so anyway, that is the key to licensure. It's the same thing as saying, do you want to go to a doctor that has not met minimum competency standards? Probably not. Do you want an accountant to do your taxes that hasn't shown minimum competency standards? You know, probably not. Do you want a lawyer representing you in court between freedom and jail time that has no minimum competency standards? It's the exact same thing. We don't want to be driving over a bridge um, designed by someone that has no structural engineering minimum competency. Okay, I am going to tell you this. There's four videos. These are really good videos. They're all on my website under the social media, YouTube, whatever section. Yeah, so they're only like two to three minutes each. They're really interesting. They're very encouraging. They're real life stories from people that were in your position five, six years ago. And they're going to speak from the heart. So I would encourage you to watch them. They're going to be telling you to take the exam early as you can, get licensed as quickly as possible, because the further you are out of school, the harder it is, because a lot of it's your undergraduate knowledge that you're going to be tested on. So there's four of those. So why is it important? To the public, like I've said before, protection of health, safety, and welfare. That's our number one responsibility, especially if you're a civil. I'm a civil. Greg's a civil. If you're a civil, you are the keepers of the nation's infrastructure. And I'm not talking just about roads. I'm talking about a safe water, a safe housing. You are basically responsible for that. So that is critical. And that's why most civils are licensed. Any more mechanicals, electricals, those numbers are picking up too. Some of the smaller um, number graduate professions like nuclear, chemical, not so much. But those degrees that you're offering here at Marshall, very important. And again, we've talked about ensuring minimum competency, that you, you have uh, minimal ethics standards that must be upheld. And if not, you will be um, disciplined for those. And you'll be able to read about those in, in the naughty section of our newsletter. 
But what can PE mean for you? This is what you want to hear about. This is where it hits you in the pocketbook. So obviously the jobs, the number of job opportunities you're going to have available if you're an EI, which is an engineering intern showing that you're one step uh, closer to the PE process, or a PE, the doors are going to open. Um, promotions, same way. Even if you're going to work for federal government, state government, there's going to be levels in which you reach and you cannot, no matter how, how good you are at that level, you cannot move up any further in the chain because you don't have those, those letters behind your name. So that's going to be important. And of course, if you can't move up, then the money doesn't show. But if I will tell you, statistics show, I could have put up a graph just like the former professor and show you that statistics show the PE is going to enjoy a higher salary over the lifetime of their career than someone without. Um, credibility, credibility with your engineering peers, credibility with the public, um, credibility with your clients, vendors, etc. Respect and security. And security could mean job security. Um, you can look at it in several different ways. Again, this person is going to speak to you about how you're going to show those initials behind your name are going to show your head and shoulders above the other people in your circle. So let's talk about it. Let me get my phone out here so I can watch my time. Okay. Um, so the basics, I've told you, we call it the, the, the three-legged stool. Engineering, education, examination, and experience. We actually have a four-legged stool because once you're licensed, then ethics is critical to maintain. So again, you're here, no question, you don't have to check it, we've checked it for you. Um, take that FE and pass it as a senior or as soon as you graduate. Computer-based, paper and pencil exams were twice a year, April and October. Now, any day that the center is open, and it's even open, some of them are even open on Sundays, but any day that the center is open, you can sit for the exam if you've signed into NCES, paid for your exam, and scheduled it. It's just like scheduling a hotel room or whatever. You know, you just log in, pay, and then pick your date. All right, and, and I will tell you, I'm, I come back your senior year. <laughs> That's what I thought I was coming for until Greg informed me that this was freshman. And I said, oh, he said, it's only 30 minutes. I was like, oh. But I come for their senior seminar class, and we're here for two hours, right? So um, you don't have to memorize all this, and a lot of it's in the information contained. But it is something you need to have constantly in the back of your mind when you're sitting there thinking, shall I sleep or not sleep in Calc 3 or DIFF today? My recommendation is not sleep. Um, but anyway, keep it in the back of your mind that this is something in your near future. It'll come around before you know it. Uh, experience, again, and I've told you it's got to be qualifying experience, which means progressive in nature, verifiable by a former employer uh, with dates and details of the engagement. Preferably a PE as your supervisor, but if not, you can put a cover letter on your app and tell the board why you think they should consider it. And then um, don't let that four years discourage you from going to get a higher level education because a master's degree will earn you a year of experience, a PhD will earn you an additional year of experience. So that's critical. Um, pass the PE exam. Those still, for most of you in the room, are going to be paper and pencil for the next several years um, and only in April and October. But you may, you may, depending on how long it takes you to get that four years of experience, qualifying experience, you may get the uh, computer-based version. Um, need to be careful. In West Virginia, after three failures, there are some extra hoops you have to jump through, defining to the board an educational plan to cure your deficiencies. In some states, like Rhode Island, three strikes and you're out, done. Never going to take that test again. And if you come to a different state to take it and then try to go back and get licensed in that state, they have some rules where if they weren't going to let you sit for the test to get licensed, you may not come back in through a process called comity or reciprocity. So just be very, very cognizant of the state rules where you decide you want to live, work, and raise your family. Um, okay, the FE, real quick. It's a six-hour appointment window when you schedule it on the NCES scheduler. 
You do two minutes for a non-disclosure agreement. Just says you're not going to share the questions outside of that room. You understand that passing this test may, may or may not allow you to be licensed, depending on the state laws. There's a quick tutorial to tell you how to navigate, but basically it's a half screen of questions. The other screen is a PDF document that is your on-screen um, formula handbook. Um, the exam time is actually five hours and 20 minutes, but you have the option to take 25-minute breaks without that counting towards your 520 and then a survey at the end. So there's seven freestanding disciplines. Um, again, there's only primarily, I think, two disciplines in the room here today. Um, but there's typically about 110 multiple choice questions. And then again, it's not open book, but you do have a reference handbook that is available to you right now. You could go on the NCS website and put in your email address and they'll allow you to download it for free. When it used to be the paper and pencil test, I actually got those books back, passed them out. I told you to sleep with them under your pillow because you need to know that book front and back. Now it's a searchable PDF. So if you need to know Bernoulli's equation, boop, fine, search, fine, pop it in, solve. So it, that's part of the reason they cut the test from eight hours to five and a half. So here's what it looks like as far as some sample questions. And here are your sample topics. So pretty much this would be for civil. So like the things on the left-hand side of your screen is the, it used to be the morning portion of the paper and pencil test, and the right-hand side of your screen was the afternoon. So you can see you're kind of focused on your first two years of school in the morning um, and your upper-level classes in the afternoon. And it's kind of a similar format. Um, for the CBT now too, but there's not really a designated lunch break. So when should you take it? What's the exam handbook or formula book I'm referring to? What can you bring in, et cetera? So let me see if I get to all that. I may, I may get to those, but if I do, I'll skip them. Senior year, if, I, if you haven't learned anything today, as soon as you can, take the test. What's the NCS exam guide? That's the on-screen formulas for you. You can bring nothing to, you can't even bring a pencil in the FE exam room. They videotape everything you do. They have video monitor or video projectors from all um, sides. They have sound taping and you have a wipeable board that you use for your scratch work. Um, Practice, available, practice tests are available on the NCS website and sold by all kinds of other vendors. And you will get your results within da, 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 five to seven days. Could be even closer. If you take the test on Monday, sometimes they release the scores on Wednesday. So um, it's sometimes a couple days. Paper and pencil, if you're still on paper and pencil for PE, you get them six to eight weeks. So it's great to have CBT. So here's just a real quick snapshot of sometimes people are like, well, I'm not sure if I want to take it in civil. I think I might just take it in um, general. But this shows you that you should take it in what you've been studying for the last four years. The higher the pass rates if you're taking it. Um, oh, no, this is the, gra sorry. This is the graduate versus uh, current student versus graduate. This shows you take it as soon as possible, not years after you graduate. Um, this shows you taking it two years out versus three to five years out, how the passage rates drop. Okay? Another video that speaks to that exact same thing, take it, take it early. Um, again, typically seven to ten days, but really it's five to seven. How to prepare. You'll have probably review courses here at the university, not anymore. Okay, because I used to be an adjunct professor at Marshall, and we would teach FE. Now they've actually incorporated it into part of the senior class, which is fabulous. Um, okay, it'll be a little ways out, but let's talk. Right now, the PE exams, paper and pencil, uh, eight hours, discipline specific, 40 questions in the morning and 40 in the afternoon for the majority of the tests. Open book. Right now, people come into that exam in the Civic Center with a wagon. A wagon, and I'm not kidding, suitcase or a wagon. 
and you can have anything that is a bound document. So like you can't have extraneous papers flying all over and landing in your neighbor's corner. But if it's, if it's in a, a three ring binder or a bound book, it is allowed. Calculator policies, uh, there are no programmable calculators allowed in the FE exam or the PE exam. There is a list of acceptable calculators, um, one Casio, several TIs, um, but if it's programmable features, it's not allowed. Um, here are all the exam disciplines. So um, mechanicals and civils, it is one test, but then in the afternoon section, you can pick a, a, a discipline specific area. So I'm going to talk about the civil just because it's similar for all the rest, but knowing the majority is what you are in here. 40 a.m., 40 p.m., all of it's multiple choice. And there are the morning is the same for everyone. The afternoon, you pick your specialty area. So it's either going to be all transportation, all water resources, all structural. Uh, 50 questions. These are just some of the other ones for the environmental versus the architectural. Environmental was the one that had 100 questions versus all the rest having 80. Um, let me see if I put mechanical on there. I don't think I have mechanical on here. There's a structural. You can review. There's no secrets about the test. The exam specifications down to the percentage of questions in every single category. Percentage of statics questions, percentage of dynamics questions, percentage of chemistry, math, all of that is on the NCES website. No secrets, just laying it out there for you. You can find out your exam scores for the PE, like I said, eight to ten weeks. We, you get an official letter from the board, but you also can log in on your own as soon as they release those. Um, same kind of prep for the PE. You're going to be working full time. You're going to have kids. You're going to have a wife. You're going to have a husband. You're going to have whatever. Your time's going to be limited. Your employer will typically be able to um, help you out and give you a little bit of study time. And then you're going to have the rest to do at late nights and on your own on the weekends. And then, like I said, once you pass, you get your PE license. And then the last step is just every other year submitting your renewals and continuing education requirements. This is a neat little thing I like to do, but the real quick and dirty of this uh, example that I have on the board is here's your class right now. There's the number of people that are going to take and pass the FE. Or ex that's the number of people are going to actually take the FE. That's the number of people that are going to pass the FE. So we've we said like 50, only 50% 50 of you will ever take the initiative and be happy enough just with a lower level position. If you take the PFE and you stick with it, only about 40% um, are going to, or a little less, are going to pass. That's how many are going to take the PE exam of those that have passed the FE exam. And that's how many, percentage wise, that are going to get to that PE designation. You have to have initiative, you have to have drive, you have to have an interest and a responsibility to make this world a better place by accepting more responsibility, but also being interested in higher salaries, promotions, owning your own company, whatever it may be, and without having PE behind your name, that's likely not going to happen. Over in your book, there's... You want to see if somebody's licensed or not that you may go to work for, it's here. Our information's inside there, and I also gave you the handy dandy little engineering scale. Uh, in, yep. in, on that is our website information as well. If you have any questions, let me know. And I uh, will just throw this up because this is the other half of our presentation. It's about our enforcement activities. There is a code of professional conduct inside of your engineering booklet speaks to everything from colluding with
with others to benefit yourself or your employer, all the way through um, not taking on projects in which you have no uh, knowledge or expertise, to dealing with misdemeanors and felonies. So take a look at it. If you have any questions, contact us. Other than that, I'll see you all in four years. And don't forget, if you didn't get a packet, get it tomorrow outside his office. Ah! Oh, my God, I can never do that again.